you doing? I swear she knows you're all there. <laughs> Hello, Booktube. And welcome to your Daily Penguin. This is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book. Uh, and we're going to touch on a number of themes. We've hit themes all along the years we've been going along. We had a couple of themes to start out with, for instance. Uh, the vagaries of translation, the, the pitiless ratio of the survival of the text themselves, because by random chance, I happened to organize part of my Penguin Classic collection once upon a time, before I lost interest, into the ancient world. So we started off with the ancient world, where we should have started off. We have since blown that chronology out of the bathtub. Uh, but there have been themes that have run throughout, the themes that have cropped up here and again. The vagaries of translation will, of course, crop back up all throughout this Penguin Classic tour. Uh, but to, our, our book today is uh, touches on a couple of others. Uh, because one of the other themes that's come up is Penguin... Uh, expanding the remit of what is t what was maybe 70 years ago typically considered a canonical classic if you have a, a reprint line that actually calls itself so and so classics then what do you include in that line and penguin built up an equity of a very strong brand recognition and then decided to extend that equity by taking some chances and i love that absolutely love that and today i guess is a Penguin classic that you could sort of include under that? Because this is the letters of John Keats, the great poet, uh, who was also an indefatigable correspondent for, for all of his adult life. Uh, uh, these, this collection is edited and introduced by John Barnard. Uh, no idea if that's the same John Barnard who, write, who writes very, very intellectual murder mysteries. But one way or another, uh, this collection centers on Keyes' letter writing from around, I mean, they're, they're all over his life, but they center on age 21 to his death at 25. So uh, they, there's a large number of them, and they, uh, as, the, as Barnard makes clear in his introduction, Keats, like all good old school correspondents, tailors his letters for their recipients. So it's not that he's lying, it's not that he's putting on false faces, but you change your register, you change your tone, depending on your different correspondence. And you, that really comes out in here. I, uh, I'm a big fan of Keats's poetry, of course, but I, I, if, I often go back to his letters. I, and the combination of the two, a big volume of Keats's poetry is not going to be any bigger than this, and then a volume of his letters, that's all we have from him, from this author, is, is those two volumes. That's all you could possibly have. And that going back to the letters, going back to the poems, really underscores the tragedy of that. I am not the only person, of course, to hold the opinion that had Keats lived, even to 50, he would be considered the greatest poet in the English language. He would have eclipsed Shakespeare. He would have eclipsed everyone else. He didn't do it, though. It's, in, it's kind of incredible that, that this light burned so brightly and for so short a time. And the the combination of the poems and the letters, and this is another example where my penguin wall needs organization because the poems should be with the letters, but the, the combination of those two volumes, the poems and the letters, uh, really gives you a sense, as full a sense as we can possibly have, of this person. I, as a penguin adjacent recommendation, I would recommend all of the Keats biographies that have showed up on this channel. There have been two in particular, Andrew Motion and Jonathan Bate. They're both fantastic books. Uh, and there again that's it that's all we get there's there's no late works of keats there's no there's no possibility of charting uh artistic evolution there wasn't any time for that to happen all we have are books about his last days books about his death that sort of thing very melancholy stuff uh and I'm not, I mean, with the, with the volume of Keats' poetry, I have no doubt whatsoever. With the, with the volume of his letters, I'm not 100% sure that the selected letters of John Keats is, uh, is a classic. Uh, but I like that Penguin includes it, very much so. And I'm, I'm grateful for it, because I go back to these all the time. Especially when some new biographical, like if, if I'm reading an article, a new biographical, or a new uh, lit crit article about Keats, I will often go back to the letters especially if I think the author of the article has read a letter wrong. Uh, just not, not in terms of misunderstanding the words, but in terms of misunderstanding the gist. And a lot of that depends on knowing 
what I what I mentioned that that he tailors his voice to each recipient. Uh, all of that is going to seem very strange to young people, I would think. Uh, unless maybe I misunderstand the the fine points of email. Uh, one of the, at least uh, I'm an avid emailer myself. I email a lot every day, hundreds of emails every day, getting and and sending. And I have noticed for myself, and I bet it's true for a lot of people too, that that variation in tone, depending on the recipient, uh, lessens with email very much. The variation between recipients lessens very much. It feels more like a telegraph, like a telegram message, than it does like a letter. And that's going to be unknown territory to a lot of you who are young. All of you who were born in the 21st century, for instance, will not have any idea what I'm talking about because you'll never have written a, a written letter, a snail mail letter in your entire life. Uh, once upon a time, I conducted every bit as busy a personal and professional correspondence as I have now via email through writing letters on paper <laughs> and and taking your time at it. And then if it's professional, I, I, I used to start every day with my correspondence. That, that was how I started the day. That was how I got the gears moving for everything else that needed to be done. And I, I, on my desk, I had two different work flows. One was for work correspondence. It had a different kind of paper. It had a different kind of ink. Uh, and it very much had a different tone. Uh, and then when I was done with the work correspondence for that day, then I would shift to the personal correspondence and break out the onion skin paper or the, or the cheaper paper and write for much longer. And in a lot of cases, both business and professional, the, the writing of the letter was a compositional thing. You wanted it to be balanced right. You wanted it to move through its moods correctly. Uh, not so much in professional. You didn't really invoke moods in professional correspondence. But in personal correspondence, you wanted, you were crafting not just a, an email, a written version, of a paper version of an email, but a reading experience. You were crafting a reading experience for the recipient. At least I was. Crafting a reading experience, something that would be satisfying as a piece of writing. Keats very, very much is doing that in his letters. And you can see it. You can see it working in his mind, especially if you've done it yourself. Uh, I don't know what a, a purely email young person would make of this, or any letter collection. Um, but I, that's what I did. When I was writing personal correspondence, I would make them reading experiences. And very often, the, the drafting and the shaping of that reading experience uh, was just the first stage. Then was the copying. <sighs> Laborious. I don't, I don't miss it. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't eagerly welcome it back. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that, that fetishizes their own past. I don't write letters anymore. But... Uh, but I remember it vividly, and the copying stage was, the writing of a letter was only halfway to your goal. First you had to write the letter, you had to compose it correctly. Then you had to, re, you had to rewrite it because you had to make copies. And um, I was fairly meticulous, I kept, for a lot of my correspondence, for a lot of years, I kept copies of not just the letters I got, but the letters I sent. Uh, and I sometimes would do that with professional correspondence as well, if I thought there was any question, uh, there would ever be any question of a doubt. And that creates a massive archive of paper, and Keats did that, and all of his correspondents did that as well, no matter who they were, no matter whether they were literary or not. The, the least literarily inclined Parson's wife in a rural village in England in, in Keats's lifetime would, by the time she was an old woman, have a gigantic chest full of correspondence that she had saved, received, copied, all that sort of stuff. And... I've gone back to this book many times. I, I enjoy it quite a bit. And, and yet, going back to it always makes me wonder. Talking about it to you always makes me wonder. A question that's come up on this channel before. What is the 21st century going to do about its lack of that very archive? What are they going to do? How are you going to give... I mean, if you're a writer of any renown, then, then you give your archive, your written archive, to some university. You, they maybe buy it from you. Uh, and it sits there in long boxes, and sometimes it's consulted by researchers. It's there forever. And it can be ordered. It can be uh, systematically put into a chronology by a grad student for a paper or whatever. But it's tangible. Who's going to be able to give their email archive to anybody? 
Who even has an email archive? I've been writing emails assiduously for 15 years. All of them are gone. Unless the, a recipient was, in 1991, was extremely technologically minded and was able to save them on some sort of floppy disk or a drive of some kind, and then technologically update that drive over the years so that that isn't corrupted, so that that is still readable. Unless that's true, or unless somebody printed them out. I, I don't know a lot of people who print out all of their emails. I never printed out any of mine. Unless that happened, all of that communication is gone. All of it is. Some of it extremely personal and fragmentary and, and very telegraphic, but others of it very considered. And not just for me, I'm not, I'm less than a footnote, but I'm talking about, what about the writers and the, the archivists for the 21st century? What are we going to have? I, I won't be around to know, and, and probably you won't either, but what is the future going to be able to tell about any of this? What's going to happen to the person who wants to write well, you know what'll happen. Otessa Moshved's literary biography. What's going to happen to the person who wants to do that? I'd be willing to bet that 90% of her email correspondence, both on her end and on the recipient's end, are gone. Just gone. So what is that, if somebody down the line, 50 years from now, wants to write a literary biography of her, what are they going to be left with? Her Facebook? Her Instagram? Her Twitter? Maybe the, those things are corporate, so... Maybe they'll still be around. I don't know. Does Facebook save everything all the way back to the beginning? What about for accounts that are defunct or are canceled by their owners? Same thing with Twitter. Is that material saved? And if it is, well, it's not an archive at a university. It's a privately held, monetarily based corporation. How will it be accessed? Will you have access to it? Will you have to pay? I, I don't know. I have no idea how that will work. I have no idea what the... Uh, the selected letters of Jonathan Safran Foer will be like. <laughs> I have no idea at all. So I guess we'll find out, or maybe not. <laughs> but in the meantime, your Penguin Classic is a recommend. I don't think you need to be interested in, or to like John Keats's poetry to find these letters fascinating. I don't think that's necessary at all, any more than you, you would need to be willing to undertake the Mount Everest of Boswell's Life of Johnson to really find fascinating Boswell's London Journal. Boswell's London Journal is totally separate. You could really enjoy it without essaying the life of Johnson. Same thing with this. If Keats's poetry has never really done it for you, his letters might. He's an, an, an engaging, very engaging letter writer. And this edition is fantastic. Barnard does a great job of grounding everything with, that you would need to know so that you're not left wondering what does that reference refer to or anything. Fantastic volume uh that i have gone i've gone back to many many times so your penguin master today is a little bit odd i the reason i say it's odd is not because i don't venerate keats's poetry but because i don't know that his letters are literary classics but one way or another i'm glad they're here so your penguin for today is a recommend um and who knows what tomorrow will be we will trek on tomorrow and see <laughs> thank you book two